Welcome to Expedition Church of the Triad. Those of you that are joining us on Facebook, we appreciate you coming and uh, connecting with us here tonight virtually. Uh, appreciate everybody that came out as well, being a Wednesday night, uh, middle of the week. And uh, Pastor is, I trust, enjoying some vacation time or has something going on. But uh, I know that he'll be blessed in whatever he puts his hand to. Praise the Lord. And uh, we're looking forward to tonight and what the Lord has to share with us. This was actually going to be something I ministered on a few weeks ago, but it's still just as pertinent today. So, <laughs> hallelujah. Uh, the Word doesn't change, and I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So, praise the Lord. Let's, uh, let's open in prayer. We'll get started. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and receive from your Word. And Father, we receive the Holy Spirit as the teacher of the church. Everything that he shares with us and teaches here tonight, Father, we receive by faith, by decision. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, let's open our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. That's where we're going to get started. Uh, this study that I jumped into myself was a study that I did because of some uh, fussing and fuming that was going on on Facebook. And you know Facebook. <laughs> There's always something going on. Somebody fussing about something. And uh, I am a member of International Convention of Faith Ministries, ICFM. Because of that, I have a lot of uh, ministry friends uh, across the country that connect in through Facebook. And a whole lot of preachers get them all together and they want to fuss. <laughs> and so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that have come up of late, but mainly more what's behind it than what the questions are. Okay, so First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you. And really, that's the title of the message this evening, is Know Them That Labor Among You. It's important to know who you're listening to. Uh, I've talked to Christians over the years, and I've been, I've been in various Christian circles, all kinds of different uh, things, from the Baptist church back in the day to uh, somebody trying to call me. I'm preaching, Brother Dwayne. <laughs> That's one of those preachers I was talking about. Uh, but at any rate, <laughs> that's funny. I was just texting him about something, and now he's wanting to call me. Uh, but at any rate, um, it's important to know who you're listening to. And no matter what circle you're in, whether it's the Baptist circles, the charismatic circles, or whatever through the years, uh, there's always somebody with some doctrine that's their pet doctrine. And... Uh, if you know who you're listening to, that's what Paul was, was saying here to the church there in Thessalonica is uh, you need to know those that you're listening to. You need to know where they're coming from, what their background is, what their issues that they're trying to bring up are. Do they have an ax to grind, so to speak? Uh, those kinds of things. And if you know them that, that labor among you, and I think that's the key phrase right there, labor among you, um, some preacher from California, let's say, that has a, really is not connected to you, is not your pastor, They're, they pastor some other church, maybe it's a mega church, I don't care. They may say some good things, but they're not laboring among you. They don't know you, they don't know your situation, they don't know your background. Uh, and a lot of people say, well, you know, my pastor is pastor so-and-so in California, for example. I've never bought into that because I guarantee you, Pastor so-and-so in California, he don't know you from Adam. <laughs> if he's to be, meet you on the street in a red hat, he would not know you. <laughs> so we need to know those that labor among us. And notice what it says, and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Now, there's a whole lot of believers today don't want to be admonished. That word admonish is a good King James word. It basically means receive correction. There are times that you need somebody that can speak something 
into your life that will correct you. You get off on tangents if you, if you don't. And that's why I appreciate having Pastor Ed as my pastor. Um, you know, he likes to talk about how he listened to me when he got born again because I was on radio in Greenville, North Carolina, as well as Lexington and Taylorsville and other stations all around North Carolina. And he would listen to me preach and, uh, and heard me and Brother Hagin and Brother Copeland and so forth. And when I met him many, many, many years later, he said, are you that Bill Bailey that I listened to back in the day? But still, as pastor, he has an anointing to minister into my life, okay? And uh, give you a good example. Back when all the political shenanigans were going on, and, you know, everybody was all been out of shape about the direction that the election was going and everything. And, and uh, man, I was getting on my high horse, and I was typing in Facebook, and I was fussing and, and all this kind of stuff. And pastor... Very casually one Sunday morning during that whole period, got up and said, you know what we need to do? We need to stay on message. We need to stay on message. Not get caught up in all this arguing and fussing, just stay on message. And I mean, it hit my spirit. I, it was, I received it as admonishment. Now, he didn't look at me and point me out and say, see, you need to get straightened up. He didn't do that. He didn't need to. He was laboring among us. I was a member of the church. He's my pastor. So when he made that statement, I took it very seriously. And I thought about it. I meditated on that. And the Lord began to deal with me. Yeah, you're getting caught up in all this stuff. Is there anything that you personally can do to correct the situation in the natural now? And I said, well, no. He said, well, then just pray mm -hmm. and intercede. And do what you're called to do. Put your time, effort, energy, mental energy, you know, everything into what you're called to do. And you know, like we were talking about before service started, i got lots to do. <laughs> I'm busy doing things in the ministry. And so it was a course correction. It was something I needed to hear. So he's over me in the Lord and he admonishes me. Now the over you in the Lord, a lot of people get all squirrely about that, you know. Pastor talks about granola Christians, fruits, nuts, and flakes. People get flaky. And back in the, what was it, 70s, there was a movement called the shepherding movement. And uh, it had some very prominent teachers that were teaching it. And basically, the whole idea was you had to have a shepherd. And that shepherd got to tell you what to do. And if you wanted to go on vacation, you had to go to your shepherd and say, Shepherd, can I go on vacation? And... And uh, he would say yay or nay, whatever, and you'd have to abide by that because he was your shepherd. And uh, I got pulled off into that for a brief period. You know, I mean, I was young in the Lord. Come on. And uh, one day it just struck me, hold on. I'm not praying to this guy. He's not my God. I'm not to receive guidance in that sense, where to go on vacation, what kind of job to take, should I sell my house, you know, that kind of stuff. So the whole movement was, had gone, they had, as, as happens with a lot of teaching, they had a few truths, the importance of leadership, the importance of guidance and direction, but they took it way to extremes. And so I pulled myself out of that very quickly and uh, learned some things from that, you know, uh, and yeah, I'm a little, uh, a little ashamed to admit that I was ever involved in it to any degree, but <laughs> praise the Lord, I was a college kid, you know, anyway, many years ago. Uh, but people look at that phrase, over you and the Lord, and they say, does that mean pastor's, you know, over me and I, he gets to tell me what to do? Not in that sense. Our relationship with the Lord is a personal relationship with the Lord. Okay, if we have questions and, and concerns in our own life, we can seek guidance directly, ask wisdom, and it will be granted to us, you know. However, there are times that if you're dealing with something and you're in a quandary and, and you go to pastor and say, Pastor, let me run this by you. I've done this a lot. Let me just run this by you. What do you think of this? And uh, amazingly, that pastoral anointing will have some word of wisdom, <laughs> that will come out and I'll go, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought of it quite that way, you know, and uh, it's, it's a blessing to have that. 
And I don't take that lightly. I receive that. That's important. So know those that are labor among you. They're over you, the Lord, and admonish you. And esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Now that's an area that uh, I think that we have let slip a lot in the body of Christ. We don't look at the ministry and esteem them highly in love as much as we should. Um, I honor our pastor. Every time I have opportunity, I'll brag on him. I'll get on the radio and talk about my pastor, Dr. Ed Taylor, said, you know. And uh, I'm sure people are out there going, well, bless your heart, Brother Bill. Glad you got a good pastor. But see, that's the thing. I esteem him highly. I esteem his wisdom because it's not man's wisdom. It's godly wisdom. So that, that's a blessing. So we're to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now there's a key right there. Be at peace among yourselves. There's too much fuss and fighting and fuming, which is what got, got me into this study, seeing what people were saying and doing on Facebook. So be at peace among yourselves. Now it goes on to say something very interesting. And we exhort you, brethren. Now the word exhort is an interesting word in the Greek. It is to encourage but it's a very strong encouragement. It's a powerful word. Exhort you, brethren. If you just give somebody some advice, that's one thing. But to exhort them is to really get right down to the nitty-gritty. I mean, that's that you, where the rubber meets the road, you know. I exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. Now, that good old King James word, feeble-minded, <laughs> there's a lot of people look at that and go, yeah, I know, there's a lot of feeble-minded Christians out there. But it's not talking about mental here. It's not saying feeble-minded like they're a bunch of idiots, okay? Sometimes <laughs> you're tempted to think so, but that's not what it's saying. The actual Greek meaning here is really interesting. This one, this one got me. I had to meditate on this one quite a bit. It means small-spirited small-spirited. And I don't know if you've heard Brother Copeland tell the story about when he first was called into the ministry and God showed him the scripture about uh, uh, that he was anointed for ministry and he was dealing with that. He was going to Oral Roberts University. He was helping Brother Oral uh, in his crusades. You know, he, he was his pilot. He flew him in the plane, but uh, he also helped him there in the crusades. And he was there one night and they were having a crusade and uh, the Lord opened his eyes supernaturally. He had a vision and opened his eyes and he saw all the Christians there that were gathered together and all of them had scrawny little bodies. Looked like they were just emaciated, like they were starving. And, uh, and, and it so overcame Brother Copeland. He said, Lord, I don't know what you're showing me, but stop. I don't want to see this. It really affected him deeply. And he said, what is this about? And the Lord said, that is how my people look in the spirit. They're small-spirited. They have drawn up and, and they're scrawny. They're undernourished. I need you to go feed my people. See, remember what he told Peter. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. And so that's what he was trying to get across to Brother Copeland. Go and teach my people. Kind of like he told Brother Hagin, teach my people faith. God is so concerned about his people. He's so concerned that we grow and mature and develop. And uh, so he showed him that supernaturally. And it really struck me thinking about this scripture here. Comfort, protect, comfort, not coddle, but help. The, the small-spirited support the weak Christian, be patient toward all men. So now he, he's talking about believers, small-spirited, supporting the weak believer, but then he switches over and says, and be patient toward all men, even people outside the church. There are times it is wise for us to be patient with people, not lose our patience with them, because again, there's certain things we can do and certain things we can't do. And in a lot of cases, what we need to be doing is in the spiritual realm, we need to be praying, we need to be interceding, we need to be giving a, a word of encouragement, we need to be sharing 
of the hope that we have within us. No question, you know, ministering the gospel, but uh, not fussing and fighting, not getting all bent out of shape. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. This, uh, this is a scripture I saw back in high school, actually, and, and uh, it helped me way back then, and, and it's certainly true today. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing they do gender strifes. Now think about that. Foolish, there's two, there's two types of things going on here. There's foolish questions, and there's unlearned questions. Now the word foolish, that feeble-minded earlier was not talking about stupid. <laughs> this word foolish is stupid. <laughs> Actually, the Greek word is stupid. Stupid questions. There's a bunch of stupid questions out there. And they don't matter a hill of beans one way or another. You know the classic one that they used to argue about in the Middle Ages with how many angels could dance on the head of a pen? What? <laughs> who knows and who cares? And I don't even know if angels dance on pens. Why are you bringing it up? You know, I mean, come on. But that's a stupid question. It doesn't profit anybody anything. And there's a lot of other stupid questions that people get into. But then there's other questions that are unlearned. Now, unlearned is fixable. <laughs> you can fix unlearned because you can teach. And if you teach somebody the word, they learn, and then they're no longer unlearned. But if they, it's an unlearned question, you know, we sometimes, and this is bad, I, I'm bad to do this as a teacher because a teacher... There's just something in us wants to get the doctrine right. Praise the Lord. And so somebody will say something and you just want to jump on it like a chicken on a bug, you know. Um, pastor kids about back in the day how we had uh, uh, confession beepers that were built in. You know, somebody make a bad confession, you go, that's your confession and I believe every word of it's coming to pass. You know, trying to get them to take their words seriously. Well, that doesn't really help that much. Now, if you've, got, if you've got a personal agreement, Brother Copeland talks about that he and Gloria made kind of an arrangement with themselves that if they caught one another saying something that was unscriptural, they would bring it up gently, correct each other to get themselves back on track. Okay, That's one thing, where you've, you've made a decision and you're agreeing together, husband and wife, to do that. But if you did that with everybody you met, particularly unbelievers, they're just going to look at you and say, what in the world's the matter with you? What, what does it matter if I say, it scared me to death? Well, it does matter, but you're not going to be able to sit them down and teach them what that means and what it, how it affects them and on and on and on. Not even a believer. I mean, come on. So there's no percentage in doing that. But at the same time, uh, I do... Uh, it's kind of like the middle of the road. There needs to be a middle of the road. We have of late, I've talked about the last 10, 15 years particularly, gotten away from the importance of confession. A lot of people said, yeah, that was, we were all into that back in the days of the Word of Faith message. I have news for you. We are in the middle of the Word of Faith message. Yeah. Paul taught the Word of Faith message. Yeah. Yeah. He said in Romans chapter 10, Verse 8, what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So if he preached the word of faith, yes. I think I'm in good company to preach the word of faith. Yeah. Okay, so the word of faith is simply the, the teaching, the instruction regarding the importance of words. He goes on and says in verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Jesus says, Lord, and believe in your heart. So there's confession. There's the believing. Then you'll be saved. So zoed. Saved, healed, delivered, made whole, spirit, soul, body, financially, socially, delivered from every temporal evil. That word so means all of those things. So whether it's confession concerning being born again, confession concerning receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, confession concerning healing, confession concerning prosperity, whatever. All the teaching concerning confession of the Word, faith in the Word, is summed up in the Word of Faith, which Paul said he preached. So, 
you know, it's not a message that has come and gone. It's a message that had some emphasis in the late 70s, early 80s particularly, and that has become known as the Word of Faith movement. But that was just God saying, hey, whoa, this, this is something we need to talk about. <laughs> but he, it didn't go away. It hasn't gone away. And a lot of people look at it that way. It's like, well, I, I, don't, I don't watch my confession anymore because we're past that time. No, we still need to be watching our confession. Learn what we have learned and stick with it. Anyway, foolish to unlearn questions avoid knowing they do gender strifes. That's exactly what was striking my heart about all these arguments people were having. It gender strife. It doesn't help. It doesn't bless. It doesn't instruct. It doesn't encourage. It just gender strife. And the questions that are being asked and talked about on Facebook are interesting sometimes, uh, confrontational sometimes, uh, downright ornery sometimes. <laughs> but in every case, they seem to gender strife more than they instruct, more than they help. So that's what we're to avoid. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. Uh-oh. <laughs> the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt or able to teach, patient, in meekness. Now the word meekness, we see meekness and we think meek like a mouse and something or someone that is just always pulling back and not you know, exerting anything, that kind of meekness. That's not the kind of meekness he's talking about. The kind of meekness he's talking about here is not to try to win the argument, you know? Not to try to come at it, I'm going to, I have a doctorate in theology. Well, that and 50 cents might buy you a cup of coffee. I'm not sure if it would anymore. <laughs> but the thing about it is, it don't matter a hill of beans. In meekness instructing those means, I am concerned about their spiritual growth, their spiritual maturity. I may want to share some things with them I think will help them, but I need to do it with patience. I need to do it with meekness, not trying to lord it over them, but trying to instruct them. So it says, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. I love this phrase, the way he says it here. They're opposing themselves. People that don't believe or receive the word, for instance, concerning healing, they're opposing themselves. I've talked to people who say, well, now, Dr. Bell, I'm glad you got healed, but now God doesn't heal everybody. Sometimes he makes people sick to teach them something. Well, no, he doesn't. And there's that chicken on the bug mentality that I want to come back and, you know, and straighten them out. But I'll just say, well, now, brother, can you give me chapter and verse on that? What? Chapter and verse on where God makes people sick to teach them something. Well, of course, everybody knows that. But can you give me chapter and verse? And it's like Pastor Keith Moore said, what do we need to be scriptural? Scriptures. <laughs> well, if you can't give me a scripture that says God makes people sick to teach them something, maybe there's something a little off about your doctrine. Just saying you know, something to consider. So I've never had anybody successfully show me where God made anybody sick to teach them something in the scriptures. That's right. Matter of fact, I've never seen a case, not one, one case, just one's all I need, one case, where God sent Jesus into a city and Jesus was about to lay hands on somebody and he said, oh, nope, wait, nope. I need to lay hands on you to receive cancer. I need to give you cancer. No. <laughs> Never one time, no, even once, just once if we had a case. We might could say that, okay, yeah, there's, there's thousands of cases where Jesus healed everybody, but there was that one case. There isn't that one case. No. Okay, so what do we need? Scriptures. There aren't any. These are all doctrines that have been passed down. Mm -hmm. Things I heard in the Baptist church growing up. 
They didn't give chapter and verse either. They just said, well, that's just the way it is. I'm sorry. That's not the way it is. Just because Grandma said it, Grandpa said it, and so forth, all the way down the line, it doesn't make it true. And, you know, I heard, again, I heard Keith Moore, he was teaching along these lines, and I heard him say something that really struck me. He said, you know, we are unusual to believe that God heals every time. He said there are millions of Christians, millions of Christians that don't believe that. We're in the vast minority to believe that it is always God's will to heal. Well, now, Dr. Bill, I know my cousin, my uncle, my whatever. They didn't receive their healing. Well, I know some folks that didn't receive their healing. I don't know what their, where their heart was. I don't know what they were believing. I don't know what scriptures they were standing on. I don't know what they were doing in their prayer closet or in their bedroom when they were praying. And, you know, maybe they were whining and bawling and crying. Oh, Lord, please heal me. Oh, Lord, move by some hook or crook some way somehow. You know, like Brother Hagin talked about. You're not going to get healed that way. Matter of fact, you're going to get dead that way. <laughs> you got to be in faith concerning healing. And as, as Brother Moore says, you got to get the wine out of your voice. As long as you still got the wine in your voice, something wrong. <laughs> so anyway... In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. These folks are opposing themselves. They're keeping themselves from being healed. Now, I got a real good example of this. I was, at, I was preaching in New Covenant Church in Winston-Salem back in 1981. <laughs> good, good while back. And uh, I, I was having a meeting, and this guy got up. We, we gave an uh, altar call for people to be born again and then people to receive the baptism of the ghost. He came down to receive the baptism of the ghost. And he stood there in front of me, and uh, he said, I, I've come to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You pray, I'll receive. Okay. So I said, well, now, first of all, are you born again? Yes. I said, you believe that Jesus is your Lord? You confessed Him as Lord? You believe God raised Him from the dead? Absolutely. Good. Well, we're going to pray. I'm going to lay hands on you, and you'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. He goes, nope. Nope. I said, what? He said, uh, I disagree with some things in the Old Testament. I went, what? <laughs> you disagree with some things in the Old Testament? Yes. I said, but you came down to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. You want to receive? Yes. You know it's a gift from God for the believer? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm going to lay hands on you. <laughs> and God's going to feed you with the Holy Ghost. You're going to speak in other tongues. Nope. Nope. I disagree with some things in the Old Testament. I said, well, my brother, that's all well and good. <laughs> and maybe after the service, you and I can talk, and we'll talk about whatever's concerning you. But right now, you have come down to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Do you believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Yes. Do you believe it's for you? Yes. Do you believe it's a gift from God? Yes. Okay. So let's pray. <laughs> And you receive. Nope, I disagree with some things in the Old Testament. I couldn't get that boy straight, no matter what I said. So finally I called up a fellow minister that was there, Ted Potts. I said, Brother Ted, can you take this brother back in the prayer room and talk to him? <laughs> and they trotted off, you know, and I, I told the rest of the crowd, I said, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Anybody here want to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost? And some people came up, we laid hands on, they received. Couldn't, I just, my brain was just tilting. What do you mean you disagree with things in the Old Testament? What does that do with receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost? He was opposing himself. He wanted to receive. He came to receive. It was his desire to receive. But it, because he had some weird doctrinal idea, that didn't even have anything to do with the Holy Ghost. I mean, that's the thing. It was some crazy something. I don't know. Might have been about washing hands. I have no idea. But it had nothing to do with receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Anyway, and the thing is, Brother Ted prayed for him, and he never did receive. As far as I know, he, he never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He opposed himself. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, very often that's what is required. 
They need to repent, which means to turn and go a different direction, and acknowledge the truth. Now the word is truth. Jesus said, John 17, 17, thy word is truth. Really, the, way, the best way of looking at this is acknowledge the truth of the word of God. Amen. If God's word says, by his stripes we were healed, if God's word says Jesus bore our sickness and carried our diseases, if God's word says that healing is a benefit for all, all sickness and disease, then that's what the word says, and that's what we need to believe. And if we believe differently, we need to adjust our believer. <laughs> we need to acknowledge the truth of the word and repent of whatever it is that we believe incorrectly. Amen. Yeah. We've all needed correction. We've all needed some things to straighten out some theological things. But notice what it says. Repentance of the knowledge and the truth and that they, notice, they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him, the devil, at his will. Now because they're off in this situation not believing the word of God, dealing with these crazy doctrines like this guy with the Old Testament, whatever it was, they were in a snare of the devil and taken captive by him at his will. And the only way to recover them is not me to recover them. Are you to recover them? They may recover themselves. They have to do the repenting. They have to do the acknowledging. They have to do the correction. If they don't, they won't be corrected. So that's being teachable. It's important that as believers we remain teachable. Now again, not that we listen to anybody and everybody. We do need to know those that labor among us. We do need to understand where they're coming from. Not just believe everything that comes down the track. There's a whole lot of people, ministers, that are teaching what I call greasy grace. Pastor you know, laughs at that, that I, I call it that. But, you know, the thing about Greasy Grace is you keep fooling around with it, you're going to slide in. And the thing about Greasy Grace is the end result of Greasy Grace is what's called universalism. Now, that's a theological term. But it basically means that eventually you get to the point that if God's grace is so strong and so powerful, God's grace is powerful, don't get me wrong. In the proper context and proper understanding of what grace is, it is a very important subject. Don't get me wrong. However, if you look at grace as something that is so strong and so powerful, it doesn't even matter whether you believe or not. Then eventually you're going to say, well, then everybody's going to be saved because the Bible says it's God's will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The Bible does say that. And so since it says that and God's will always comes to pass, does it? No. Think about it. God's will was that the children of Israel not have a king. Yes. He plainly said, I don't want you to have a king. And the children of Israel said, we want a king, we want a king. Everybody else got a king, we want a king. And God finally said, all right, let them have a king. Go anoint somebody, but it's going to ruin you. And it did. Now, the crazy thing about it is they chose to have a king. It wasn't God's perfect will. But David's ministry as king of Israel was as king. See, God will work with people wherever they're at. He never originally wanted them to have a king. He wanted to be their ruler himself. Basically have a theocracy <laughs> instead of a monarchy. Okay, But uh, still... He was able to use David and his ministry function and everything, even though he was king, because the people wanted a king. So God's will doesn't automatically come to pass just because it's his will. You've got to get in line with his will. And, you know, a lot of people got a lot of great ideas and a lot of things they want to do, and they want to say, oh, Lord, bless my idea, bless my idea, bless my idea. Well, find out what God's idea is. It'll already be blessed. Yeah. All right? So instead of constantly begging, Lord, please bless my idea. No, just find out what God wants you to do. 
do what you're called to do. Anyway, that's, that's free. That's an aside. <laughs> That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him and his will. So this is important. Being teachable, being instructive, uh, instructable, being someone who will receive from those that are able to speak in your life, that's important. All right, let's go to 1 Timothy 1.3. 1 Timothy 1.3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest tra uh, charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now this is, this is one of my little nitpicks. <laughs> There's people out there preaching doctrine one way or another way. Greasy Grace is a good example. Like I said, Greasy Grace will lead down a primrose path to other false doctrine. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here. <laughs> and, you know, pastor would never probably say this from the pulpit, but I'm not pastor, so I can say this. <laughs> Hallelujah. I used to enjoy listening to Creflo Dollar. Okay? And over the years, he kept sliding into Greasy Grace and getting a little more into Greasy Grace and... Yeah, with this and that and the other. And, that, and I noticed he wasn't teaching at Brother H Copeland's meetings as much as he used to. And, uh, you know, things like that. Well, now he's saying tithing's not of God. Amen. Well, now let me tell you about this. <laughs> I have no tithing is scriptural. Yes. I have tithed my whole life. The results of tithing are apparent. Hallelujah. Yes. I'm blessed of the Lord. Yes. And, uh, you know, my dad, my dad, when he was uh, a Baptist uh, Sunday school teacher, he was asked to speak one Sunday morning on tithing. Pa the pastor of the church asked him to do it. And he got up and taught. And he had ten silver dollars, big, thick, heavy, old-style silver dollars. And he took those silver dollars, he stacked them up one at a time. Ten silver dollars. Had a little stack there on top of the pulpit. And then he took the top one and set that over to one side. He said, now that's what God wants. You get to keep the rest. That's tithing. <laughs> <laughs> and I never forgot that. That little word picture of a demonstration of what tithing is. He took it off the top, the first fruits. He gave that to the Lord returned it to him, as the scripture says, and the rest of it was his do with what he wanted to do. Now, you can take more and give beyond that 10%. That's fine. That's wonderful. That's laudable. Good to do. You're blessed if you give beyond the tithe. But there are certain blessings that adhere to tithers that are attributed to tithers because of covenant. And tithing was pre-Old Covenant. Melchizedek, Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek, who Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Okay? And in the New Testament it says, here, those here on earth, in the flesh, here on earth, receive tithes. That was in New Testament scripture. So, they tithe. They never argued against tithing. They never saw a reason to argue against tithing. And my point about tithing is, the only reason a lot of people want to argue about tithing is they don't want to give. Right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's the point. Yep. It's all me, 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 me. And i got to have more money to do what I want to do. And I, if, I could, man, if I didn't have to tithe, I could buy a boat. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's all on the flesh. And ultimately, that's where Greasy Grace leads, is flesh orientation. What I want to do. I mean, I've, I've even seen people say things like, you know, well, yeah, you know, I've gone out and technically committed adultery, but after all, I'm pre-forgiven. Uh, that don't work. That just plain don't work. And God takes that very seriously. He hates that. Oh, God doesn't hate anything. He does hate certain things. There are things that is written down in the Bible that it says, and God hates this, and God hates that. Well, I need to get myself in line with the things and understand what he hates and not do those things. Right, right, yeah. 
And the things that he enjoys, I like doing those things. And then I find, guess what? I get blessed. <laughs> so now, I don't have any fuss with Creflo directly. You know, I love the brother. I tell you, he's a precious brother in the Lord. I trust that he will see the word and repent and turn and get his doctrine straight. I happen to know someone, the guy who's trying to call me on the phone, <laughs> that he's a, a minister who used to work uh, with Norval Hayes and knows a lot of these guys personally. And uh, this particular brother told me last time I talked to him, he said, uh, you know, Brother Copeland went and talked to Brother Creflo directly. So, I mean, there, there are things going on that we don't know about. Right. So I, you know, I trust he'll come around, but if he never does, doesn't change what the Word says about tithing. No. Amen. See, I need to come to where I understand what the Word says and believe that. And everybody on Facebook wants to argue about tithing. Well, I, I won't participate. No. I put my little statement there. You know, I've tithed all my life. I'm blessed of the Lord. I'm going to keep tithing. Y'all do what you want to do. I'm sticking with the Word. Amen. And immediately, all these preachers come out and go, nye, nye, nye. it's not doctrine. It's this, that, that. We don't do that today. Oh I'm not saying a word. No. I'm not arguing back because I will not strive. Amen. All that does is stir up the pot. Stir up people out there. <sighs> anyway, he said... When I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. See, these, these foolish and unlearned questions will gen gender other questions. They'll, they'll stir people up and they'll just keep spiraling down this road. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and a faith unfeigned from which some have swerved having turned aside unto vain jangling desiring to be teachers of the law and really that's another thing that I'm seeing. There's a lot of people out there they want to be seen as big dog preacher. Well, now, brother, let me tell you what my doctrine is from the scriptures, all my study of the Greek and the Hebrew. <sighs> They're trying to build a kingdom for themselves, trying to elevate themselves. We don't need that in the body of Christ. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Now, we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Now, hold on, hold on. This is the first Timothy. This is Paul writing. The preacher of grace. The one supposed to be teaching the greasy grace stuff. <laughs> he doesn't, believe me. He said, we know the law is good. See, they like to say, oh, we don't tithe because that's under the law, and I'm not under the law. Well, no, we're not under the law, the Mosaic law. But there are certain principles that are true across the board. Yes. God instituted tithing and he never said, oh, by the way, we're not doing that anymore. He never took it back. No. Why? Because it's a blessing. Amen. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. He's not stealing your money. You know, as a matter of fact, God said, Malachi, will a man rob God? And they said, wait a minute, when did we rob you? In tithes and offerings. See, I mean, come on, it's right there in black and white. I'm sticking with the word. Anyway, understanding either what they say nor wherever they affirm, but we know the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers and fathers of mur murderers or mothers, for, uh, for manslayers, whoremongers, them that defile each other with mankind. Uh oh. For men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, there's such a thing as sound doctrine. And there's nothing wrong with sound doctrine. Now, back in the day, early days of the charismatic movement, we all were young whippersnappers, and we were defiant of doctrine. Because <laughs> the the 
church was teaching X, so we were going to go Y. You know, that, <laughs> that was our whole thing. And we were getting squirrely because we weren't adhering to sound doctrine. There is a good thing in sound doctrine. According to the glorious gospel, that's where sound doctrine comes from. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who has enabled me for that to be counted faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord is exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. And right there is the bottom line. We need to be in faith and faith works by love. Yeah. We need to operate in love. And all the fussing and all the fighting and all the jangling, I like that word, jangling, <laughs> all of that doesn't benefit anybody. What benefits folks is sticking with sound doctrine. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. How be it for this cause I obtained mercy. Hallelujah, I love God's mercy. That in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern of them which should hereafter believe on him up to life everlasting. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I love that verse. That is a charismatic chorus song that I used to love to sing. Every time it would come up, I played it on the auto harp. I used to do home Bible studies. I had an auto harp, and we would play that. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I tell you, I love those days. I love the simplicity of singing Scripture, building yourself up with Scripture, hearing the Word of God, surrounding yourself with the Word. You know, I like a lot of the modern music. Don't get me wrong. I listen to it. But there's just something about that old scriptural sound songs and choruses that we used to have. I miss those. And David Ingalls, you know, I, that's not my style of music, as, as a pastor says sometimes. Not my, my exact style of music, but I will play David Ingalls in a heartbeat because his, his songs are anointed and they're just sound. Hallelujah. Anyway, I digress a bit here. Uh, this charge I committed to these son Timothy, so this is Paul talking to his son in the faith, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Now notice, some people have put away the teaching concerning faith and it become shipwreck. It was happening in his day. Happening today as well, unfortunately. Now here's the point that I want to make in verse 20 about what I said earlier about Brother Creflo. He names names here. Yeah. Of whom is Hymenus and Alexander, of whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may, not, may learn not to blaspheme. <laughs> whoa, Paul, whoa, whoa. He not only names them, but he says, I've delivered them over to Satan. Whoa. That's something that you will not hear too many people do in these days. Okay? Well, I don't want to do that with Brother Creflo, don't get me wrong, but I think there are times and situations where in the body of Christ we need to tell folks this brother has an issue. He's teaching some things that are leading folks astray and we need to just stay with the Word. Amen. And that's really the heart of what we're talking about here tonight. We'll, we'll unhook there. I've got some other scriptures along those lines, but I think that gets us to where we need to be in what I wanted to share tonight. We're not fighting anybody. That's the key. We're not fighting against anybody. And I don't want to fuss with anybody. I don't want to fight with anybody. I don't want to stay in love with everybody. And it's hard sometimes because they want to... Some of these ministers on Facebook... They want to fuss, 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 and they want to, what do you think, what do you think, and I won't respond. Amen. And that's okay. 
I would rather let it go, let it all pass, stay in love. And then I've had many occasions in the past where um, I had one pastor friend of mine. Well, this goes back a long, long ways, uh, back to the 70s. And a pastor friend of mine, he came to me one day and says, Brother Bill, I have had a revelation from the Lord. Immediately I went, uh-oh. <laughs> I said, really, what is it? He says, I have learned that I am above sin. I no longer sin in any form or fashion. I said, uh, what about pride? <laughs> he went, what? I said, you say you don't sin. You're not committing adultery? No. You're not fornicating? No. Uh, what about pride? Now, I see what you did there. <laughs> and the thing is, he thought he had this new doctrine that Christians could no longer sin at all. It was impossible for Christians to sin. Well, now there's this first scripture in 1 John chapter 1 that says, If we as believers, if we, say we have no sin, <laughs> then the truth is not in us. And I shared that with this pastor. And I said, are you telling me that there's no sin in you? You never sin. Uh, what's that scripture say? Well, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, I'll have to study that out. <laughs> I said, brother, I think you need to go back and look at the Bible and get straight on some of these things. But see, that's the thing. Crazy doctrine comes out of these kinds of situations where people are stirring up and they're getting all these crazy doctrines. They're, they're ignoring sound doctrine. Now, sad to say, in this particular brother's case, he per persisted with that teaching. He then was caught in adultery with his church secretary. His church folded. He had to leave the community, and I lost track of him. I don't know whatever happened to him. And that's a shame. That's a shame. Because he had a tremendous ministry. And he had a great church, but it all fell apart because of false doctrine. All of these shipwrecks that occur, occur because people get off of the false doctrine. And that's why I wanted to share this, is to strike your thinking and to let you know, stick with the word of faith. Amen. Know those that labor among you. Treasure I treasure our pastor. Um, pastor and Miss Janie posted a thing about their anniversary, which strikes me that's what they're doing. They're celebrating their anniversary. Duh. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, you know, they were talking about their anniversary, and I, I wrote, as I, as I responded to it, I said, Happy anniversary to my precious pastors. Because they are precious. They're such a gift to us. And I so appreciate everything they've been through. And I mean, like I said, when I was in the hospital and, and was given a week to live, they were right there. They weren't from California and didn't know who I was. They were right there. Pastor was laying hands on me and praying for me. Miss Janie was giving me sheets of paper that had scriptures on it. And I mean, I knew all those scriptures, praise the Lord, you know. But it was good to have them. We read over them every day. Belinda would read them out loud to me. I couldn't even pick up the paper to read. I couldn't lift my hands. I couldn't get them off the bed. I was dying. But she read those scriptures, and I would listen to them, and I would listen to them. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And they ministered to me, and I came out of that and healed of the Lord. Now, it t it's taken time to get fully back. My strength's getting stronger every day. I you know, I, I came in tonight with my, my walker because I had all this stuff with me, but I've been coming to church just with my cane. Hallelujah. You know, uh, not using the walker as much and just getting stronger, trying to do more and get my legs working and all that kind of stuff. But time, what does that matter? You know, I like to point out that the first miracle it says that Jesus did was the, you know, making uh, the water into wine at the wedding feast there in Cana of Galilee. But it says the second miracle, the second miracle 
that Jesus did is when he ministered to the nobleman's son. And the, the noble's son wasn't even there. He just said, you know, go your way, he's healed. And the man turned around and went home, and he was healed as he went. Yeah. Time went yeah. by. Mm -hmm. He was healed as he went. And it was still a miracle. Yes. So I look at what happened to me. Time went by. It was a gradual, uh, you know, healing, and I, I got better and better and better as time went by. Still a miracle to me. Yes. Still a miracle to me. Amen. Yes. To go from on your deathbed and a week to live to five years later teaching the Word of God. My voice is strong again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Doing everything I'm doing in the, in the ministry. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. These are precious things. These are things that I take, I don't take for granted. I take very seriously. And so I appreciate our pastors. I appreciate the church. I appreciate this place. Glory to God. I mean, think about that. The miracle that God had to do to get us into this building. I don't take that lightly. That's, that's a manifestation of the fruit of faith and of confession and of prayer that's gone forth for years, years and years and years. And we treasure this. A lot of people say, oh, well, the, the, the building isn't the church. Well, that's all well and good. But it's awful convenient to come in here and get to preach and not be meeting in some community center where they just had some kind of weird service down the road of crazy things going on yeah. Yeah. having to preach over jumping around and shouting and playing crazy music I mean yeah. you know I mean we at least we had a place to meet but yeah. not nothing like this this is great hallelujah so I appreciate it I just wanted to share all that with you trust you got something out of this tonight received from the Word of God hallelujah uh, we'll go ahead and receive the offering. Those of you that are watching via uh, Facebook, online, if you'd like to give, you can give. Still using the Square Cash app. Uh, it's still Faith and Victory, Faith Victory Church. So it's pound Faith Victory Church. Uh, that is being changed. Pastor asked me today if it had shown up at North Carolina uh, Secretary of State as a, as a change, and it hasn't yet. It's still in process. So uh, eventually it will truly be Expedition Church, even legally, but we are Expedition Church of the Triad, and we're gra glad that uh, y'all are here and are listening. So if you'd like to give with Square Cash, or you can still use PayPal. PayPal is uh, still donations at paypal.com. Uh, uh, you can also, well... Uh, I started to say that there's other ways to give online, but, uh, well, you can go to the website, expeditiontriad.org, and there's a, a thing there, donate, and you can give there. So, praise the Lord. Let's pray, and we'll, we'll uh, receive tithes and offerings tonight. Father, we thank you for this time we've had. We receive the tithe and the offering now, Father, in faith, given in faith, ministered in faith, and we believe for the blessing of the tither and the giver on all the folks here tonight and those that give online, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Joe, you go ahead there. Uh, we will be having service Sunday. As far as I know, Pastor will be back. And uh, so that will be 1030 Sunday morning right here uh, at, what is it, 6302? 6203. Uh, Walter Wright Road in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina. I'm still working on the number. I'll get the number right. I keep wanting to transpose it. <laughs> I do that with my own home address as well. But at any rate, uh, if you, matter of fact, this is a good point to bring this up. If you go to the website, expeditiontriad.org, and you click on the little tab at the top, Directions, there's a little wizard that comes up, and you can plug your address into the address line, hit the button, and it will print out directions, turn-by-turn turn directions, and then you can hit a button, it'll print it out on your printer, and you can just use that to come straight here. Hallelujah. Always want to use technology. Got to have it. Yeah, I told Pastor, I said, I'm going to rig it to where they can get a, a map online. He goes, go for it, Dr. Bill. <laughs> so praise the Lord. We, we like to do stuff like that, keep things moving. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed it tonight. We'll catch you next time, those of you online. Uh, we believe for you to prosper and be in health, and we just thank you for joining us here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.